Um, so I'm going to just sort of sum up in a very short uh, form because I want to give a maximum time to everyone here for a discussion and questions. Um, so I work in the Faculty of Law. I, uh, I help to um, administer our LLM in arbitration and dispute resolution. And uh, recently I've been doing research in the area of dispute prevention uh, along the BRI and also beyond that within projects uh, supported by uh, multilateral development banks and how are they, what's being learned in terms of community engagement. So I just wanted to share a few points that I find uh, offer some hope. Um, I think we have a lot of negative news and, and, and I think that there are a few things that I'm learning that I think I find very encouraging. So the first thing I wanted to do is just to acknowledge Dr. Ma's effort. I think uh, hearing the details of how he has worked for over 20 years in this field of operationalizing these principles of green finance. Um, this itself, as was mentioned, is a form of dispute prevention. And you can identify projects which are going to align closely with the long-term sustainable uh, aspirations of a community by its nature, that alignment of principle itself is going to prevent conflicts from occurring. So um, I think there is a common uh, understanding that we need to protect our earth, we have to take care of it. And this is something that is shared broadly. This is not a, <laughs> this is not limited to a particular nation or a particular ethnicity or a particular race. I think we all have this common aspiration that um, the, the well-being and the, uh, the interest of one part is closely tied with the well-being of the entire planet. And, and conversely, and vice versa, the suffering of one part uh, affects the suffering of the whole. And so there is this understanding increasingly of our interdependence, and we can't ignore um, suffering, and we also can't um, also discount the benefit that we receive from sustainable practice. So, so one of the areas that I think is very encouraging is this sharing of knowledge, this knowledge generation and development of norms uh, around the world um, in terms of the principle of community engagement. So beginning in the early 2000s, all the way up until the recent times, we've seen a number of global acts and principles and norms that countries uh, collectively have agreed to, beginning, I think, early, early on with the equator principle, which is this idea that uh, banking institutions who agree to these principles must um, include mechanisms for stakeholder engagement and avenues for redress grievances by communities. And so these principles uh, have been accepted and adopted by um, most uh, financial institutions that support uh, major infrastructure projects. This was then followed by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in 2011, um, which also expects companies to establish mechanisms to arrive at shared understanding and agreements about um, the result, the resolution of community investor disputes and how to also um, engage the viewpoints of communities in, in the development of these projects. Um, OECD similarly in 2017, um, developed guidelines for meaningful stakeholder engagement um, in the extractive sector. Uh, we see these principles reflected in the sustainable development goals, especially the principle of partnership to achieve these goals. Um, also, the, the aspiration towards sustainable cities and communities is one of these uh, uh, goals that uh, nations as a whole have agreed to. Um, there's also the UN-supported principles for responsible investment, which uh, really engages the private sector um, in uh, setting standards for itself and implementing those standards. Um, so I think all of these uh, reflect sort of an emerging global consensus that um, four major projects, major infrastructure projects to um, operate successfully, they really do need to engage meaningfully, as um, Professor Palmer was mentioning, with local communities in their design and their planning and their implementation. Um, and so what we've seen from the mid-2009 to also 2018 is that the multilateral development banks incorporated these principles into their internal structure and their practices. So uh, from this point, we see that these organizations have built in requirements um, 
some of them are like the IFC Sustainability Framework, the, um, the World Bank, the IDB, Asia Development Bank, also the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was newly formed. All of these banks, which are housed and uh, based in multiple jurisdictions in different geo, uh, geopolitical uh, sort of um, um, with various geopolitical perhaps aspirations, they have a common understanding, I think, of this, the principle of community engagement. So what may differ in terms of their aspirations, perhaps from a geopolitical level, they have a common interest from a very um, principles-based level in terms of what needs to be done for communities and for sustainability. And I think this is the second thing that I find very encouraging is that there is a, almost a, you can see almost a parallel language, uh, a common language that's emerging about how do we understand uh, community engagement. Um, and so one of the things that I've been looking into is once these principles have been incorporated since this mid 2000 point, um, do we see a difference in terms of the number of conflicts arising from these projects? And um, what, we, what we can see is that before uh, 2010, multiple projects would be stopped or ceased based on lack of appropriate consultation. So uh, they, the, the roads would be blocked. The, there would be some spill, for example, of a mine, uh, mining spill into a river. Uh, there would be um, uh, frustration by the local community and blockage and then eventual uh, stoppage to a project. Um, after these experiences and after this um, uh, period of learning, beginning in this uh, mid-2013-2015 period, um, the, 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 the shift you can draw is from one of community notification. Basically, I so-called consult or engage you by notifying and telling you what is going to happen in your community to one where you see this standard of consent, informed consent. You need to actually, the participants, as Dr. Ma was saying, there has to be disclosure and then understanding uh, a common framework, a, a taxonomy, for example, of what's happening with the environment and assessment, and then an, a consent process. So for those projects which are high risk, th this is now the standard. Um, and I think what we see is that following this implementation of this standard, this higher level of standard of consultation, uh, we are seeing a stabilization and in some cases a reduction in conflicts that are rising amongst these multilateral development banks. So that's what I'm currently looking at are the statistics within these banks and how are they uh, being tracked based on what mechanism of consultation has been um, uh, during, during this 20-year uh, time frame. So these are some hopeful signs and I think um, are encouraging in terms of um, supporting sort of the further development, the further refinement, the further understanding, what does it mean to engage meaningfully, to, to generate knowledge meaningfully with a local uh, community, to uh, understand the benefits of a project as well as the risks, how to mitigate those risks effectively, and to maintain ongoing channels of communication with the community, with relevant stakeholders, uh, throughout the course and the life cycle of these projects um, for the benefit of all those involved locally, but also regionally as well as uh, globally. So I will leave it at that. I do want to leave time for a d dialogue. So um, I do find that encouraging and I, and I want to uh, appreciate all of our panel members and Dr. Ma for efforts and understanding from multiple dimensions, uh, how we can uh, look at the greening of the BRI and what can be learned. So we do have questions from the Zoom group and I've been uh, receiving some of these by phone. Um, so if it's all right, I will begin the first one, um, I believe is for Dr. Ma uh, from Lai Zijin. Uh, so her question is, I have a question related to green financing and sustainability linked bonds. Um, unlike green bonds, SBL does not restrict the use of proceeds. Theoretically speaking, corporations can use the proceeds in a way they want, such as investing in carbon intense activities, as long as they meet goals that they set. Um, they don't suffer any penalties. So the majority of the issuers of SBLs in China are state-owned enterprises, and they've already been assigned some paths in the top-down method to cut down emissions. 
it's relatively easy for them to realize the objectives required by SBL to raise money. So is this the kind of a greenwashing? What, what mechanisms do we have to prevent this situation uh, from taking place? I will start with that and then we'll come, we'll, we'll alternate. So then next, oh, okay, so you'll be, so we'll take a question from the room following. Thank you, thanks for the question. I think uh, sustainability linked to loans and bonds uh, um, actually do require the uh, issuer or the borrower uh, to achieve certain uh, sustainability goals. It's not as uh, the, uh, the question stated that they can do whatever they want. It's not the case. Uh, sustainability linked to loans and bonds uh, are required by the investors uh, when they sign a contract with uh, uh, the lender or the uh, uh, investors, they need to meet certain sustainability um, objectives, um, which are presented in the form of KPI. And these KPIs could be in the form of X percent reduction in carbon or carbon intensity or X percent improvement in energy efficiency or something. So there must be some KPIs uh, that's uh, uh, part of this, uh, this transaction. Now, your question may be uh, referring to some of these companies uh, would have achieved these uh, um, you know, emission reduction anyway, uh, because they are required by the government. Now you come to the market and uh, raising uh, financing through sustainability linked loan uh, with uh, sort of favorable terms. Are you actually cheating? Um, it's a very tricky question. I think <clears throat> it depends on how the KPI is set. If the KPI is set uh, with not enough ambition, uh, meaning if you can reduce a little bit of emission, then I will label this as sustainability link the loans and bonds, then it's a, it's a target setters problem. Right? <clears throat> this uh, target setting process, uh, it's not ambitious enough, it's not green enough, uh, but still they may be green. Uh, they may be asking some reduction from the average. Uh, then we probably can label this uh, as not a very green project. It's, uh, it's a light green project rather than a dark green project. Uh, this is how I would describe it. But indeed, it's a problem of the entire you know, framework for such products. That's why, as I said, the G20 is now working on a transition finance framework, which will ask regulators in different countries uh, to set a more specific uh, standard requirement on how do you set targets? Uh, how do you make it, uh, these targets consistent with significant contribution to SDG rather than only marginal contribution? So in the future, I think these issues uh, will be gradually resolved. Thank you so much, Dr. Ma. We have a question inside the room. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for indulging me. I've just got, I've got to leave and lecture. So thanks very much. I'm uh, Professor Parker from the Laboratory for Space Research here at the University of Hong Kong uh, with a strong interest in uh, green initiatives and um, climate change. Um, so I've got merely a few comments really rather than questions at this point. Uh, I think first, you know, the green belt and road, first of all, I think the BRI is, is morphing into a global development initiative from, from the mainland now as a big thing. And I, I think that's great. Um, in terms of what Edward said about the, um, what was actually the dispute there? I wasn't sure what the dispute was, but the establishment of um, any uh, green infrastructure uh, that's clean to develop energy, for example, by wind power is fantastic in a very poor country, presumably in West Africa somewhere. But then the extraction of the profit into luxury malls in Hong Kong <laughs> to provide um, high-end organic produce for the, the rich and famous. I'm not quite sure that's the... Are they, oh, I wonder how much of the profit is actually being reinvested into local green uh, enterprises in West Africa. So anyway, that's just a comment on that from a socialist perspective. Um, but my main comment is really, uh, I may be the only scientist in this room. I may be the only scientist in the ether there in Zoom. Uh, but I think for one thing that I did notice, we heard a lot about politics and about social issues and even spiritual issues. But the one thing I didn't hear about anywhere was the scientific issues. And to be honest with you all, um, the only way we're going to green anything and save the planet is through science and technology. Science and technology will underpin every attempt that we make. And how we address that through our politics and through social acceptance of what's needed to be done as things get ever more existential, frankly, um, tipping points have already been breached. Um, plans we make today will become obsolete soon when we realize the magnitude of what is actually confronting our planet. 
So uh, the greening is things like, you know, what is the Belt and Road? It's a transport mechanism to get goods from A to B and to enrich and develop en route. Uh, laudable, and I support it. But uh, it's how you do that. You don't transport with dirty um, lorries burning diesel. You look at electricity, you look at electric vehicles, you know, even uh, hyperloops that uh, people like Elon Musk are developing. But, you know, I think that's the thing that for me, the elephant in the room is there doesn't appear to be much of a recognition or discussion. I mean, I know it's there. I know that you get advice on all these things, but you need, you know, independent scientists without fear or favor to tell people what they need to hear about the reality on the ground. You can have law like we're having now, but natural law, the physics of everything, that's really what's going to drive our responses to all of this ultimately. So anyway, um, thank you for allowing me to comment. That's really just what I wanted to say. I'm sorry I have to leave now. Um, great panel, very interesting discussion. I'm glad I came. And, uh, but I think we you really need to think about having an independent scientific voice on everything and make sure it is not being uh, biased by uh, vested interests. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you if you don't mind later, if you can email me, it would be wonderful to continue that dialogue. And I think sure. just a matter of space and logistics, but I think what you say is absolutely true. And I think science is at the core of understanding how we uh, protect the natural environment. So it'd be great to talk more and just explore how we might collaborate. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm sorry I have to leave. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. So we have, okay, so I'm getting a message that we have another question from the Zoom group now. So um, let's see. Um, what will be the impact of this on the future US-China relations? That's interesting. So that's a very big question. I don't know if anyone would like to start or if it's directed at anyone in particular. Um, if anyone would like to volunteer. I, I, I'll just share a few thoughts. I think um, definitely we, we've seen um, uh, development initiatives um, become politicized. I think we've seen that uh, you know, in response to one in investment initiative, another investment initiative is announced as an alternative to the first one. Um, and so there, you know, this is an interesting dynamic which does exist in the world. But I think what, what I find uh, what I find encouraging and what I've been increasingly focused on is at the very grassroots level of these projects, whether wherever they originate, um, what is what is being understood as as the mechanism for both implementing these principles of sustainability, but also um, uh, how are we um, how are how are local communities gaining the benefit of these projects and how are they um, providing their input into these projects. So it's, it's very, I find very interesting that though uh, various national systems may have different uh, organizational structures, differing um, forms of governance, there is actually a emerging consens consensus in terms of the localized governance of these projects. So there may be originating from uh, bodies uh, of you know, they're financed by uh, entity, uh, um, regions with differing uh, political structures, but at the, at the grassroots level, the governance structure is largely uh, consistent, which is um, this process of um, invest scientific investigation on the impacts of these projects, um, a mechanism for sharing stakeholder input, and then a mechanism for ongoing monitoring and a mechanism for uh, channeling grievances as they as they progress. So that governance mechanism, I find, is um, increasingly harmonized, which I find uh, very unique and very interesting in this particular context. But I don't know if anyone else has a thought on this question. Yes, David. Yeah, it's, it's actually very interesting because, um, so I guess speaking, um, uh, I guess the question, the impact of this. So I suppose if, if the this that is being referred to here, let's say it's a Belt and Road Initiative, for example. So what happens when we look at it? Because the I guess the uh, in the international media space, something like the BRI is being treated as a kind of a, a zero-sum competition between China and the West. But 
I'll just give an example of uh, where I've actually uh, been doing some research uh, in northern Laos. So this is a region which um, has been trans uh, like momentous transformations are going on as a result of the construction of the recently opened railway between Kunming and Vientian, uh, as well as some uh, economic uh, special economic zones near the Lao China border, as well as the Lao Thailand border, as well as other highways. And so what was previously a very remote region uh, is now really being transformed by all kinds of infrastructural investments, um, many of which uh, are coming from China. Um, but what we can see is that the local actors, they don't see this as we're engaging with the BRI or we're engaging because we're choosing this country or that country. They just really are interested in what is better for them. And these uh, building infrastructures are things that building connectivities is something that others can add on to that. So we had a China built railroad, which has now been opened up. And so what's happening now is that the Japanese are building new infrastructures connecting to that railway. So rather than seeing at a zero sum competition between Japan and China, which geopolitically may be at odds, but when you look at the local situation, that's not what happened. One connectivity was opened, which is then leading to another actor uh, independently creating new connectivity. So investing in new special economic zone, which is being invested by Japan and Thailand's largest real investment developer, which has major investments throughout Southeast Asia. So we can see different actors are piling on to open new connectivity and investment rather than separate, you know, separate and mutually competitive um, um, uh, programs of uh, BRI this or whatever that. And so another, um, uh, and what's interesting is that we can see that, uh, so there's that level of, of uh, competitive, uh, the structure of public discourse, which is designed to emphasize division on the one hand, but then we have what we look at, what we heard, for example, from uh, Dr. Ma is at more low key levels, consultations going on between actors of many different countries who are away from all of these, um, all of these uh, contests who are building consensus uh, to develop norms that can be that um, develop common norms and principles, which um, uh, which can be applied by all of the actors, uh, regardless of uh, which country they are coming from. So I think it's important to be aware of all the other dimensions, um, rather than framing everything in terms of Sino-American relations or things like that. From me. Uh... Because uh, apart from being a lawyer, uh, and I'm also a principal representative of the International Chamber of Shipping, China in the office, uh, and the International Chamber of Shipping is uh, the most influential and biggest ship owners and operators association, uh, the, the trade unions in the world. And we are uh, very much involved in um, the shipping uh, maritime convention and regulations. And in the next uh, 20 to 30 years for the shipping industry is also very important for us to reduce the uh, uh, carbon emission, uh, carbon emission, and therefore that uh, the, sh the shipping industry is funding the way to reduce it. And uh, in the international and also governmental level, um, people are talking about uh, the measures, rather measures, that how to reduce the carbon emission. And uh, the ISS actually previously proposed uh, uh, submissions to the International Maritime, Maritime Organization, which is the regulatory body of the UN for shipping. And that was actually technically buried by the state members because that's, they think, some of the members think they are too aggressive, including China. Um, but later on, China, together with another few countries, made their own promo pr proposal submissions to the IMO. And since our proposal was buried, was uh, killed by the by the state members, we we try to find another way to work out because we believe that is uh, for the for the whole benefit of the of the global shipping industry's sustainability, and therefore that the I understand I uh, was involved with the in the discussions with the Chinese government because we represent um, about like 40, uh, 40 states international. Uh, ship owner associations as well. And therefore that we are discussing uh, the proposals with the Ministry of Transport and also China 
uh, maritime uh, maritime safety administration who are in, in charge of this kind of uh, shipping policies and regulations and try to find or reach a concept uh, that uh, whether the China's uh, policy can be adopted can be accepted by the major uh, uh, major society of the shipping uh, global shipping and I would say that that is uh, perhaps very close to uh, the agreement. And I would say, okay, even now the geopolitical issues are quite uh, tense, especially between not only between China and the US, but also between China and the Western, some of the Western countries represented by the US, of course, and also UK. Uh, we can see that in the uh, in the in the green area, in the for the for the for the uh, sustainable development uh, of the world, uh, there are still quite a number, quite a different aspects that the two parts can work together and to find the middle way to uh, push a press ahead with uh, the good things for the world. Yeah, so that's my uh, story and example. Um, the question inside and one that was just uh, delivered online um, will we take the last two um, and then we will introduce the question. Um, so this one is about Martin. Uh, the new finance buyback is meant to be grievance mechanism. Can we hear more thoughts on the implementation plan of green finance guidelines? Thanks. I think you referred to the new guideline coming out of the Chinese banking and insurance regulator, uh, which you refer to as the green finance guidelines. So I'm not involved in drafting of this. I, I used to be involved many years ago when I was in the central bank on similar uh, guidelines. Now, my my sort of interpretation, it's my personal interpretation of who, uh, the uh, need for this uh, provision uh, is to make sure that the uh, uh, complaints from the community, from NGOs and others which consider a bank's lending project has a you know, harmful uh, environmental implication have a maximum, uh, maximum within the uh, bank, uh, within the banks uh, to be resolved. And uh, I remember a couple of cases back a few years ago, uh, some NGOs were writing to me uh, knowing that uh, I, I, I'm a chairman of the Green Finance Committee, saying that I have a complaint on this Chinese bank and it has a project in certain location that's bad for environment. Can you pass on my complaint to someone in the bank? Uh, which means that they don't know who to you know, talk to. Uh, that, that's a lack of you know, grievance mechanism uh, problem. And I think in the future, such a mechanism should be developed uh, so that the, within the banks, um, there is a procedure of how to handle this kind of complaint. Uh, for example, there need to be an office, need to be a person who is responsible for processing and making decision, and need to be a process of maybe consulting to the party experts, uh, including someone like you guys, and uh, need to be um, you know, having a timeline for replying um, to whoever is raising this, uh, this complaint. And probably a process of who you know uh, channeling some of these cases into arbitration mechanism and so on. That's what I understand. Thank you so much. I saw a question from uh, Grace. Ip, so please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, sorry, the renewable energy um, projects and also uh, AI and, and automation uh, for the automated vehicles can also help in these kinds of projects. So will the, uh, will the green finance and investments that 
Dr. Ma, you have I mentioned, will um, take care or we have a more preferential advantage for this kind of uh, projects. And actually, uh, for our there are also many technology involvement. Just as Edward, your project, your case study has uh, illustrated the wind power projects that I feel, uh, I think a lot of technologies is inside the wind turbines. Yeah, thank you. So uh, on your question of this uh, green investment principle uh, relationship with other principles such as the principles and you know, UMPI, uh, my answer is that when we drafted the GIP in 2018, uh, the other principles existed, right? Mm -hmm. So the equity principle, uh, which was actually hosted by FC, uh, were part of the drafting team of our GIP. And uh, UNPII is also part of our drafting team uh, of the green investment principle. So we actually consolidated all the existing principles at that time and uh, take the best uh, you know, available uh, ideas and practices into the green investment principle. But uh, we tailor made it uh, in a way that it's uh, more applicable to emerging markets, more applicable to uh, infrastructure projects, uh, so that uh, they're more relevant to the uh, audience or the participants that they were, uh, uh, we, we, we organized. Uh, that's probably answering your first question. Secondly, whether it's binding, legally binding, um, initially it was not. Uh, it was a voluntary set of principles when we invited uh, the signatures to join. Uh, if you say it's legally binding, they're not going to sign. Uh, nobody's going to sign. And uh, we have to tell them it's voluntary uh, in nature and uh, we will enhance the capacity of doing that over time. And over time, we increase the elements of the uh, compulsory uh, sort of uh, nature uh, elements uh, by requiring, in fact, uh, all the signatures to begin to report. Uh, on the achievements uh, of their green investment, you know, how much of investment is green, whether you can, you know, uh, disclose certain information of your green activities and the carbon intensity and so on. And we can see the reporting, uh, those institutions that meet the reporting criteria uh, gradually increase as a percentage of a total. And we're actually going to report the results this afternoon in our annual report. So uh, I can say that uh, we are gradually enhancing the, uh, the compulsory nature of the principle uh, over time. And finally, coal versus renewable. Uh, as you know, China announced uh, stop uh, investing new coal by power projects in uh, the Belt and Road area uh, last year. And uh, uh, since then, you know, all the Chinese bank has stopped. Uh, these are new, new projects, uh, but there are uh, issues we need to address. You know, what, what about the existing ongoing projects? Are we gonna continue? Or are we going to convert them in the phase two into a renewable? Uh, that's something to be discussed and we need to push for that. And also, uh, if you're not investing in co-related projects, you are left with more availability of funding to do what? Uh, can we make sure that uh, these funding sources are used uh, more to renewables, to electric vehicles and so on and so forth? But then it come up with a question of, of, of availability of bankable green projects. There's a lot of complaints saying that these, com these countries simply do not have uh, available uh, bankable projects. Um, the projects uh, you know, <clears throat> that's meeting the investment standards are so limited. And uh, uh, that's why I think next phase, we're gonna channel more resource for capacity building, for developing the pipelines, uh, rather than only asking the banks to invest in these uh, uh, non-existent uh, projects. So I think that's a great note to end on. Um, and those are great questions. Thank you, Grace. Um, so thank you very much for, for joining us and to those who joined us uh, on Zoom. We also appreciate your participation and your question. Um, I believe this has been recorded by our team. So if uh, you'd like to go back and have a look through um, anything that you'd want to review later, you're most welcome. Um, I'd like to thank Zuei and Ishan for all your support. Um, and Dr. Madrin, uh, Dr. David Palmer, and uh, Mr. Edward Liu, and also Lunar, who's been doing the AV work here. So thank you all for joining and for your participation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.